record on this computer and we should be good to go. So like I said, about 7.45 and then we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. Now, before I get any further, I wanna take some time to uh, acknowledge the land that we occupy here in the Lake Simcoe region. Um, so the Lake Simcoe watershed has been inhabited by the indigenous peoples since creation. We recognize the Williams Treaty First Nations, including the Chippewas of Georgina Island, Rama and Beausoleil, and the Mississaugas of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, the Credit and Scugog Island. We are committed to renewing our relationships and deeply appreciate their historic connection and unwavering care for this land and water. And I think uh, this is a, a beautiful connection to what we're talking about tonight, because when we talk about climate change, um, really that comes down to caring for our land and caring for our planet. And we have a lot to learn um, from our, uh, the First Nations and the Indigenous people who have occupied this land um, since creation. Now, who's here tonight? So uh, I'm going to be leading the webinar. My name is Katie, and I'm an outdoor educator for LSRCA. So during a normal year, I uh, work day to day out of the Scanlon Creek Nature Center. So that's our edu outdoor education center in Bradford. And I teach kids uh, kindergarten through grade 12 outdoor education programming. I am an Ontario certified teacher. So uh, I've got my teaching degree um, and I've been working in environmental education for give or take eight years now. I used to work for uh, another conservation to, to the South. So um, a conservation authority, Toronto Region Conservation Authority. And prior to that, I actually worked for Ontario Parks. So um, I've got lots of experience all across Ontario teaching outdoor and environmental education. And with me tonight as my co-host, I have uh, my colleague and friend, Cassandra Connell. So she, uh, she's also an Ontario certified teacher and she's kind of my counterpart on our outreach education team. So typically her job would be going into the schools uh, in our watershed and teaching environmental education in our classrooms. She's also um, our early years specialist. So she launched our amazing four school program that we have at Scanlon Creek. And uh, she's uh, kind of the key, the lead in our therapy in the woods program, which is partnership with Royal Victoria Hospital. I'm actually gonna mention that in a, in a later slide. So that's who we are. That's what we're. Uh, that's what we do at Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, and a little bit about the Conservation Authority, just in case anyone here tonight hasn't heard of Conservation Authorities or isn't aware of us. Um, what we are is we are a local watershed management organization. So we we were incorporated under the Conservation Authorities Act in 1946. So LSRCA has been around since 1951. Um, and our job is to, we are, we've been dedicated to conserving, restoring, and managing the Lake Simcoe watershed. So if you look here on my slide, anywhere on the map that um, is colored in there, that's, the, that's, the, that's within our watershed. One of the things I love about conservation authorities is our jurisdiction is determined by water. So in our case, our common body of water is, of course, Lake Simcoe. And anywhere you see on this map that's colored in, anywhere in our jurisdiction, the water that lands on that, on that land from rain, snow, melt, whatever it might be, um, will eventually drain into Lake Simcoe through the rivers and tributaries. So the cool thing about this uh, way of determining a jurisdiction is uh, it doesn't care about, and water doesn't care about municipalities. So if I were able to zoom in here on Barrie, per se, um, part of the city of Barrie is in the Lake Simcoe watershed, but part of the city of Barrie uh, is actually in the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority watershed. And that's just because the water in some parts of Barrie flows through a different course. So this is our region here. Um, tonight's presentation is designed for teachers who uh, live, work and play in the Lake Simcoe watershed. But if you're here from outside the watershed, that's okay too. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna be sharing is, uh, well, you can take it away and um, put your own kind of local uh, lens on what I'm sharing. So our department at LSRCA, uh, Cassandra and I work for the Education and Engagement Department, and we're a small but mighty team. There's five of us in total, um, and we operate with three pillars. So our main pillar is, of course, school programming. So we support the schools, um, the, the public school board, the, the Catholic school boards, the private schools, um, all within our watershed. And we support them through nature center visits. So that's when kids, uh, in, again, a normal year could come visit us at the nature center in Bradford for, um, for curriculum linked outdoor education. We also do outreach visits. Um, so that's what CAS normally is up to is going to the schools and doing those curriculum linked programs. We support school events. So we've done things like Envirothon or water festivals showed up there and, and supported those types of events. And uh, we do, if you're a high school teacher, if I have any, uh, 
um, senior teachers in, uh, in the group today. We also offer SHISM and ICE training. And last but not least, we create teaching resources. So that's what I'm very excited to share with you tonight is one of our new teaching resources. Under our training and development pillar, we offer um, teacher professional development workshops. So we've done those in the past. We have teacher resource kits. So if you're interested in having your own kit of things um, to help you bring your learning outdoors, you can check out our website to learn more about those. And we do, we host some pre-service teacher candidates and sometimes we also host co-op and uh, volunteer students. And last but certainly not least, we also have a community programming pillar. So these are the programs um, that we offer for members of the community. So we have outdoor education camps, um, for example, our spring into Scanlon March break camp. We run that at the Nature Center in Bradford. And we also have a forest school program that Cassandra, I was telling you about Cassandra launched um, for, for younger kids to, to come experience forest school. Um, another program we're very proud of is our program in partnership with the Royal, Royal Victoria Health Center, our Therapy in the Woods program where uh, early learners can um, reach their therapy goals, but outside rather. So they, they're not doing their therapy in a clinical setting. They get to experience that um, outdoors in the woods, which is pretty cool. We're also going to be launching a new hike series this year, all about climate change. So stay tuned for that. I'm really excited about that one. And we work hard to do social media engagement. So at the very end of my webinar here, I'm going to plug our new Facebook group, um, which is something we've kind of developed in the past year and it's a great way to connect with us and uh, other like-minded um, environmental and outdoor educators. So that's what we're up to. We're a busy group. But uh, I'm going to get to the purpose of tonight's webinar. So uh, tonight's, uh, we, we, uh, tonight's webinar is all about climate change in the Lake Simcoe watershed and a new teaching tool that we've created to help support teachers uh, bring climate change education into their classroom. I see in the chat, Bonnie saying best Facebook group ever. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. I agree. <laughs> um, so when it comes to climate change, um, unfortunately, it's not a good thing, but this is something that is happening and it's happening right here within our watershed. It's happening all over the world, but uh, we, we have, um, our science department has done a lot of research about exactly how it's going to impact us here in the Lake Simcoe watershed. And uh, in doing that, they've come up with some climate projections that I thought I'd share just to kick off our, our webinar tonight, just to put into perspective what we're expecting to deal with when it comes to climate change. Um, so a couple things. The first thing, our temperature projections. So when we read these projections, we uh, refer to a baseline. Baseline refers to real climate data from the past. So uh, on average in the past, what our temperatures have been. And our, uh, our annual mean temperature in the past, in the past sort of 30, 40 years has been about seven degrees Celsius. We are expecting in the Lake Simcoe watershed by 2080, that average temperature across the year to be about 12.3 degrees Celsius. So that's an increase of 5.5 degrees Celsius, which is obviously gonna have a lot of impacts um, on, on our lake ecosystems, but also on, uh, on everything else in our, in our lives. What's interesting here, what I like to take home from this slide is uh, if you look here, we're suspecting that uh, in our winter temperatures are going to increase by 6.5 degrees, which is pretty wild because our baseline uh, winter temperatures are minus six degrees Celsius. And of course, a six and a half degree increase means that in the winter, our average temperatures are going to be above freezing. So that's going to have really, really uh, major implications on our lake ecosystem again and, um, and what happens when our average winter doesn't result in freezing or snowing. Our precipitation projections are also a little scary. Um, we're expecting um, more rain. So our baseline um, data comes down to 884 millimeters, um, but we're expecting by 2080 that to rise to about 970 millimeters. And uh, not only that, but we're expecting when the precipitation does come, it's gonna be more intense for longer durations and that's gonna happen more frequently. So we're expecting much more, many more major storm events in uh, by the years 2080. Our growing season uh, is going to become about a month and a half longer. So our baseline uh, data there is about 150 days a year um, that we can, we can grow crops. But we're expecting that to become much longer due to climate change to about 193 days. So overall, big picture here, what we're expecting to see in our region is warmer winters with more rain falling than snow, more of those freeze-thaw cycles um, in the winter, 
longer, drier, and hotter summers, more extreme precipitation events, and a longer growing season. So we're really expecting, you know, things to change through climate change. Um, this isn't really unlike other places across Ontario or even Canada, where this is kind of uh, consistent with other regions. But um, some of these things affect us differently here, especially since we surround a lake ecosystem. So because of this, our uh, organization at LSRCA um, has responded. And the way we've responded is we come up with two different strategies. We came out first with the climate change adaptation strategy and the adaptation strategy is all about how are we going to change to deal with the results of climate change. So what can we do to help our watershed residents stay safe um, and minimize the impacts or the negative impacts from climate change. Then we came out with our mitigation strategy and our mitigation strategy is actually how we can combat um, climate change and lessen the effects of climate change. So how we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions or how we can pre um, prevent climate change from getting worse. Now, in both of these documents, a critical piece is, of course, education. We all know that if we want to build a climate resilient community in the Lake Simcoe watershed, we have to, to work on educating the watershed residents and uh, the watershed students. So that's led me to uh, where, where I am today and what I'm here to present to you. We also, uh, I just wanted to share, um, because this study was done by Dr. Ellen Field at Lakehead University and, um, and through uh, Lakes, or Living for a Sustainable Future, or sorry, Learning for a Sustainable Future, LSF. Um, they did this sort of survey across all of Canada to see where everyone was at when it comes to climate change and education. And they had some really interesting findings that helped guide our project. So uh, the first finding I kind of pulled out was the majority of Canadians believe that more time on climate change education is needed. So this is across many groups that were surveyed. This is students, this is teachers, this is general public. Um, the majority of Canadians all say, yeah, we should probably be spending some more time in schools in the public education system teaching about climate change. Now, when it came to surveying the students, what's uh, interesting here is the students widely believe that climate change is happening. So they, they really, uh, you know, understand this is a real problem that's happening uh, across the, around the world, but of course in Canada, but they don't, uh, they don't as widely express confidence that anything can be done about it. So this is really concerning to me. This is one that kind of uh, gave me an aha moment because it, we all know that, uh, of course, apathy doesn't lead to action. And really what we need right now is that action. So this is something I wanted to address um, as we expanded our climate change education portfolio. And the last but not least, another big takeaway from this survey was um, teachers, so educators, were they, they agreed they want to teach climate change, but they needed more PD or resources to help connect climate change to their courses. So it's really hard. We all know teachers are so busy um, and they've got so many curriculum expectations to cover. So it can be hard to kind of add this whole new unit or this whole new massive topic into um, the current cur curriculum we already have. Um, so all three of these points helped to guide me to, uh, to what I'm presenting to you, which is our brand new um, climate change presentation. Now, when I share the slides, I, I included a link here to a summary video from the study. It's a really nice video uh, and it features students from uh, actually Simcoe County District School Board. So uh, local students to us. And it's a nice summary of what they learned from this uh, survey and this study. So I am excited to launch to you tonight our new uh, climate change presentation for grades seven and eight educators. Um, the goal of this presentation is to provide a curriculum linked presentation um, with an accompanying teacher guide. So you're not just going to get the presentation, you're also going to get a teacher guide that has um, speaking notes and curriculum connections and all of that good stuff. Um, this is designed to be easy to implement for teachers with minimal preparation. Like I was saying, I, I'm totally aware of how busy teachers are, right? Uh, that we've all uh, got a lot on our plate. So this was meant to be something that a teacher could access read a little bit about and sort of launch it in their classroom really, really quickly. Um, it is designed to be an entry point for climate change education. So it is pretty basic. If you're a teacher who has been uh, including climate change edu education in your class uh, for a long time, some of this might uh, not be new to you. It might be kind of uh, entry level, but we thought it was important to provide this resource um, so that a teacher who maybe wasn't as experienced teaching climate change could use it to be, uh, and use it as that entry point to their classroom. 
And uh, the last kind of goal of our presentation was to provide students with a local context to climate change and show them how what's happening on the ground locally. I always think to uh, my education experience, and I think when I was taught about climate change, we, I, I, all I remember is the picture of the polar bear, right? The polar bear in, uh, in the Arctic and the ice is melting and all that. And as much as that's important and climate change is a global issue, um, I think as a student, I removed myself from that. I thought, oh, that's, that's, a, that's an Arctic problem. But the reality is climate change is here and we're already seeing the effects. So I think adding that local context helps students to understand um, you know, what's happening in their own neighborhood or their own community. Um, we also wanted to talk about how local agencies are responding to climate change. So um, we're not the only agencies doing adaptation and mitigation strategies. Municipalities are, are putting them in place. Even our provincial and federal government are taking these approaches to climate change. So we wanted to give the students uh, a chance to learn a little bit more about uh, the response to climate change we're seeing here in Canada. So I'm gonna show you right now how to access the resource and then I'm gonna walk you through it really quickly um, just, just to give you an idea of what's included in the presentation. So it's, this should work here if I got my text sorted out, let's see. So again, you'll, you'll get this link. Um, actually, I think Cassandra might share it in the chat box here, but also uh, we will be emailing my presentation out and everything is hyperlinked. Um, so you can access our website um, and this is what you're gonna find. It has a little bit of details that I've just shared with you about what the presentation is. Um, some presentation planning, things you need to know. But the most important thing that you need to know from this page here is this button right here. So where it says, get your free resources to access our resource, you just have to click that. And it's gonna bring you to a form here. So the reason we're collecting information is we just wanna have a better understanding of who's downloading our presentation, who's using it. And uh, we're collecting a little bit of data about how many students hopefully our, um, our presentation is reaching. So you'll have to fill in the information here. And then when you click next, you'll have to send it off and you will get a, uh, an automated email. So let me show you what that looks like. Check your, your junk box, just in case, uh, if, if you don't see it come to your email right away, just check your junk. Um, but this is what it'll look like. It's an automated email and um, it's got two links here. So it has one link to download the climate change presentation and one link to download the teacher presentation guide. So you'll need both of those things. Now, if you download the presentation, let me just open this up here. So when you click the presentation, whoops, I got to go back to the beginning. This is what's going to open up. So you will be launched straight into a, a ready to go live Google slide of the presentation. So this is really handy because as soon as you click that link, you can um, open that up. Now the presentation, of course, works like you would expect. So you can click through all of the animations are built right in. And uh, a fun feature I just learned about um, about Google Slides is if uh, to make your presentation even more accessible to your students, if you click this closed captioning button, um, it'll actually, as you'll see at the bottom there, it'll start transcribing your words, um, which is just an added accessibility feature, which is kind of cool. I also like this pointer option because it turns your, your little mouse into uh, a pointer. So you can click through the slides and you're basically right in delivery for your students. Now, if we go back to that email, the other link will open up the grade seven, eight climate change presentation teacher guide. So this part of our, our package is um, it's a PDF. So you can open it and view it from your browser, how I've got here, or you can download uh, the teacher guide to save it to your computer, or you can even just print it directly from here. Now, the teacher guide is where all the good stuff is. So if you scroll through, um, it's got an overview and some of the, the details about the presentation. So the presentation length. I suspect um, if you were flying through this presentation, it would take 90 minutes. But if you're taking some time to really go through things, I suspect it'll take you 120 minutes with your class. Um, and that's because there are some interactive pieces built in for the students to participate in. Um, so I've got a word bank at the top of our um, teacher guide here. So you can share that with your students if you would like. Um, and then that brings us to the slide overview and speaking notes section. So the way this is de designed is it'll tell you the slide number, it'll tell you the slide title, and then it'll provide you with some speaking notes that you can use to deliver this presentation. Now the bold text for the speaking notes, that indicates that that text appears right on the slide. So for example, 
whatever words you're seeing on the slide will appear bolded in the teacher guide. The regular text um, indicates that there are additional speaking notes that are not on the slide. So you can you could literally read this as a script if you would like, or you can, of course, uh, <laughs> take parts of it or, or use parts of it as you will. And then the last bits of information that are included in the speaking notes are in italicized text. So uh, this text indicates like a teaching tip or an activity to inspire some student interaction. So for example, in our first slide here, or slide here when we're talking about the Lake Simcoe watershed, um, it's, giving you, it's giving you a suggestion that's saying, put your pointer on any creek or river you can see on the map and then ask the students by looking at the map if they can tell which way the water flows. That's just gonna add some context uh, to students learning about the watershed. So um, those are just suggestions. You don't wanna read the italicized text word for word to your students. Um, they're just su suggestions to sort of add, uh, add depth or add flavor, if you will, to, uh, to your presentation. Now, <laughs> the good stuff here is the final um, column on the side here includes the direct curriculum connections to the Ontario curriculum. So we have connected this presentation to the grade seven and eight science and geography um, curriculum. And it lays out the specific expectations in the curriculum that are being covered by that slide. So you see here, this first slide is hitting that grade eight, it's the, the water unit, um, earth and space uh, curriculum expectation 2.2, 3.2. Um, but as I go through those change, right? So then, you know, the fifth slide, it's gonna target the grade seven ecosystems unit and so on and so forth. So this, um, this is designed to make it really easy for teachers to, to know exactly what part of the curriculum they're achieving by, um, by delivering that slide. And this is also nice too, because if you were a grade seven teacher, of course, you can spend some more time on the slides that are, are really hitting the grade seven curriculum um, and go you know, into a little bit more depth. So this is what the teacher guide looks like. Um, it is quite long and I'll be honest, I added probably more information than you'll need on each slide, but I figured it's always good to have more than too little. Um, so there's, you know, some more information and some, and some more um, tidbits on each slide than you might even end up using, but uh, it's all there for you if you would like to use it. So coming back here to the slideshow, um, I, I, it would take me again 90 to 120 minutes to go through the whole slideshow in depth, so I am going to fly through it just to give you kind of a brief overview of what's included in the presentation. Um, again, so we put this first slide I've actually we, we talked earlier at the beginning of my launch uh, webinar here about the Lake Simcoe watershed, but we thought this was important to include to give uh, students context about the reason we're talking about this kind of strange boundary we're talking about uh, the, the watershed that flows into Lake Simcoe. So that's a quick overview. Um, we included learning goals and success criteria so the students can really understand what their, their goals are and, and by the end of the presentation, what they, they should be able to do in that success criteria. Um, and then we kicked it off with um, a First Nations teaching. So this is the seventh generation principle, um, which is a teaching from many First Nations groups. Um, and it's all about the, the, the idea that the decisions that we make today should um, result in a, a sustainable or a good future seven generations in the future. Now, this is a really beautiful quote we got here for our um, corporate uh, adaptations to climate change strategy um, from James L. Port, who is the environmental health coordinator at Georgina Island First Nation. So I just put the, the quote directly in there and I kind of envision um, teachers sharing this with their students and or maybe having someone read the quote out and uh, taking a minute to, to let it sink in. Um, such an important teaching. And then we built in right after that, a think pair share activity. So this is where you can start to see this, this slideshow as much as it's just a presentation, it is meant to be an interactive lesson. Um, so this think pair share activity would launch the kids into, uh, again, <laughs> thinking, pairing and sharing. Um, so they have to think of, I'm gonna turn this pointer off, it's driving me crazy. Uh, they have to think of one action um, that the people living seven generations ago did that still affect our lives today. And so this would be a good spot for you to, to and it, it um, to, to review, you know, what was happening 150 and 200 years ago. And those types of prompts are included in the teacher guide. And then the second part of this is they have to think, pair and share, uh, what is one action you've taken today or like in your life that's going to affect the people who live seven generations in the future. So this could be as simple as like, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Is that going to affect people seven generations in the future, 200 years in the future? Yes, how, no, why not? 
So it's just starting to get them thinking about their purpose and their role on the planet and how it's, it's um, their lives have been affected by our ancestors 200 years ago and how they're going to affect their ancestors 200 years in the future. So that's uh, the, the minds on kicker, <laughs> kick off to the, the presentation. And then it gets into your really entry level climate change um, facts. So this slide's gonna go over basically what is climate change, the definition, what's causing it. It goes into um, climate versus weather. So what's the difference between uh, the weather changing versus the climate changing? Um, it's got some entry point stuff around greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. Um, and even some, some simple high level examples of the common greenhouse gases. So I made these little uh, comics here. This one uh, on under methane, it's always good to have a sense of humor. It's the cow uh, releasing some flatulence there. It's, uh, that's one of the big emissions. So you can uh, have a good laugh with that, uh, about that with your grade seven, eight students. Um, a little bit more on greenhouse gases. And uh, then it's gonna launch them into thinking about what they already know. So when you put this slide up, um, you can ask them, of course, what, what is this slide telling us? What is this uh, diagram? Um, what is this diagram of? And of course, grade seven, eights are going to say the water cycle. This is a really simplified version of the water cycle, um, which is nice. They all know that, um, that water moves through our environment in a cycle. But sometimes what we don't think about is how everything else moves through our environment and through our world in the cycle. So then I would throw up this slide here, which is a slide of the carbon cycle. Sometimes uh, students are less familiar with this one. So you can discuss with them how uh, the natural carbon cycle still works in balance, just like the water cycle, right? Everything is in a nice balance in the water cycle. Same thing here with our carbon cycle, right? So animals uh, breathe out carbon dioxide, uh, plants through photosynthesis use carbon dioxide and put out oxygen. We have this lovely little cycle here. But then this is where it gets interesting. The problem is humans are producing excessive quantities of greenhouse gases that have carbon, right? And they're altering the way they would naturally cycle in the environment. So then this slide is going to show us the carbon cycle today. So this would be a nice uh, point to stop um, with your students and talk about, okay, what's different? What's changed from uh, the last diagram to this one? Let's identify some key things here. Um, so it just, uh, meant to put into perspective that we are altering, humans are altering these natural cycles. Sometimes when we teach even the water cycle, it's like, oh, that's untouched, right? Students are like, that, that's just how it is. The, the water cycle moves like that, everything's fine. Um, but this is meant to show them that, you know, humans are a force on this planet and we are altering the natural cycling of nutrients. So after that, it goes into your typical greenhouse, uh, di greenhouse effect diagram that I couldn't find a better diagram. This is just the best one to demonstrate, um, you know, the accumulation of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and how that is trapping in, in heat. And then it's going to get to the local stuff. So we're already seeing the impacts of climate change in our region. All of this is in the teacher guide as well, but this picture here was taken in Aurora in 2017, I believe. And uh, this one was 2019, I think in Georgina. So this picture, this is a wild story. Um, these are ice flows. So a river kind of overflowed during the spring melt and um, the ice flows ended up in front of these people's driveway. So they couldn't even back their cars out in the morning. So starting to think about, you know, climate change isn't a problem in the future. We're already starting to see some of these, uh, these impacts. This slide has a link to a TVO climate special. Um, I suggest watching this if you uh, are a grade eight teacher, it hits more on the grade eight water, um, water unit, but it is, uh, grade sevens might also enjoy it. And then, so it gets uh, a little bit more into, with all this happening now, what can we can expect with our future? Now, the next slides are actually what I've already talked us through this evening. So there are uh, climate projections. Um, but before we get to that, we included some slides to explain to students how scientists actually end up at these projections, right? Like, how do we say, you know, the globe is going to heat up six degrees by 2080? Where does that number come from? Is it a guess? Is it, is it, is it a wild guess that it's going to heat up six degrees? Um, so we wanted to include some stuff um, in here so students could get a better grip on what the scientists and climate scientists are learning. So, uh, Climate models. To predict the future of our climate, scientists use computer programs called climate models. So these work like a laboratory in a computer. They allow our scientists to do experiments that of course we couldn't do in real life without majorly impacting our, our, our climate. 
and they allow study, sci scientists to study how different factors could affect the future for our climate. So in our region specifically, I'll just click through really quickly here. Um, we have gathered weather data from the Shanty Bay Weather Station for the past 100 years. There's a lot of data about the actual weather that has happened. So this is not, these aren't guesses. These are data collected because it's like you look at the thermometer and the thermometer says it's 20 degrees today. That's concrete data. There's no questions about this. Now, all of that data is collected and uh, we can use that and climate models to determine what's going to happen in our future. So this slide also helps students um, conceptualize what a projection is versus what real data is. The first half of the slide, of course, shows real data. So you can see here, um, it's the data between 1900 and 2010 or closer to, to 2020 here. So what we see in this graph is again, data from the thermometer from the Shanty Bay weather station. This is stuff that has happened. The black line shows us each year what the average annual temperature was. And the red lines show us the average temperature across each decade. So this is stuff that's happened. But when we talk about projections, we're going to use this information to guess what's going to happen in the future. So the projections are the next piece of the graph, the next iteration that we're expecting to see. Of course, we're, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know this for sure, but we have some pretty, a pretty good idea of what's happening based on the trends from our long term data. So in this case, these ones over here are climate projections. We're guessing that the, the trend that's happening is going to continue on, which allows us to guess what the temperatures would be in 2060. So this is just a nice way, again, to conceptualize. So students don't just, a lot of times they read, they, they're thrown facts, right? Like, oh, you know, there's going to be 30% more precipitation. This is to show them that those, those facts are substantiated. This is real, um, real they're real calcul calculations done by scientists. Um, and then this, the climate uh, projections are exactly what I showed you at the beginning of our webinar here. So uh, they're going to show your students, just like we talked about, what we're expecting to happen here in the Lake Simcoe region. Oops. Now, after that, um, your, the slideshow goes into the actual impacts of climate change. And it's going to break it down here into environmental, social, very important, and economic impacts of climate change. Um, so this is nice. This is where this starts to fit into the geography unit, right? How is climate change going to impact um, impact people, right? Like what's that going to change about our lives and our distribution patterns and all that? So a lot of the time when we think about climate change, we think of only environmental, environmental impacts. How is it going to impact the animals and the plants? But it's important to get, start to think about how it's going to impact us and the economy. Um, now, these types of slides are really good for their curriculum as well, because they're starting to uh, hit on the idea of thinking of cause and effect, right? Um, so one cause can have multiple impacts. In this case, we're demonstrating that, you know, due to increased temperatures, Lake Simcoe no longer freezes over the winter. And then that leads to the fact that we are no longer able to ice fish, which, which results in loss of jobs in ice fishing tourism. The water warms more quickly in the spring, so some fish species cannot reproduce. The people who live on Georgina Island can no longer rely on ice travel to get to mainland during the winter. And then you're going to have your students sort out, okay, A, B, C, D, which of those is the cause, which is the environmental impact, which is a social impact, and which is an economic impact. So they have to start to think about um, the intricacies of, uh, of all of these impacts. And I've got a few more slides like that. So this one's demonstrating how um, everything in an ecosystem is connected, so a chain reaction. It might be hard to picture, but rea in reality, um, extreme rainfall events due to climate change end up leading to algae bloom in our lake, which causes fish to die. So you might not think that having more rainstorms is going to kill fish, but it, this is to demonstrate that you know everything is connected, and uh, this is why the, the climate crisis is so urgent. This is another example of that cause and effect. So in this case, they're going to have to sort, they're going to have to put A, B, C, D into order to think about, you know, what's the first thing that happens that causes the chain reaction. And then it gets into, so I, I, I was happy because my favorite word is yikes, and I just left it right in there. So it's yikes, what are we going to do now? Um, and this gets into what, how um, local organizations are, um, are kind of addressing climate change. So we're going to take what we know and use it to adapt and mitigate. 
You've got a slide there that is going to talk all about adaptation. So how that's changing our lifestyle to suit the new environmental conditions and finding solutions to manage the risks. So, you know, you have your, your house on stilts, right? Cooling stations in your schoolyard because, you know, who knows, maybe the weather's too hot to have recess in the summer or, um, or in, in June, say. Um, this, this part of my slide didn't age well. It says develop more opportunities to work from home or, or do school from home. Right now, as much as uh, it's, been a, it's been nice working from home, I would love to get back to the office. I'd love to see all my colleagues. And then it takes you to mitigations. So uh, planting more trees, right? So uh, planting trees that serve as carbon sinks, using renewable clean energy, developing new technologies that uh, use renewable energy. These are things that actually prevent climate change from getting worse. And here's an example of something that can do both. So we have a green roof and it's an example of both. It can, um, add, it's an adaptation for climate change because it helps to cool buildings, but it's also a mitigation because it helps to absorb greenhouse gases. Now, our final activity for this presentation is actually a sorting activity. So the way I developed it is I had the idea that hopefully students could have chart paper and if not, they could just use a regular paper. They can copy this down onto their sheet of paper. And then again, you as the teacher can determine whether you want this to be an independent activity, a group of two, a group of five, maybe other desk groups, whatever you've got set up in your classroom. And the idea is they're going to sort a whole bunch of scenarios into adaptations, mitigations, impacts, or something that's both an adaptation and a mitigation, like a green roof. So then you're going to put up this slide here. And this has a whole bunch of different scenarios of things that could happen, will happen across the Lake Simcoe watershed. And your student's job is to sort that into their Venn diagram. So for example, they might read, boots with cleats are provided to Newmarket staff during winter to prevent slipping in icy conditions. And your students are gonna have to think through, okay, is that, an, is that a mitigation to climate change? Eh, not really, it's not really preventing climate change from getting worse. Um, is it an adaptation? Yeah, kind of, you know, everything's more slippery due to climate change. So our, our municipal staff need cleats on their boots in the winter. So they're going to sort that out. And then uh, the nice thing is this will lead to a good class discussion because some of them are kind of, kind of gray areas, right? Like, is that an adaptation? Is it both? Um, so this will lead to some nice class dis discussions when you take it up. Awesome, and uh, I'm just watching my time here. So I'm gonna fly through the last, uh, the last piece. And then we get to the positive thinking, right? Okay, we've just terrified you. Climate change is terrifying, but it is not too late, but we, we do need to, to address this situation. Um, the climate projections we learned about earlier seem scary, but they are based on what will happen if we do absolutely nothing to change the course we're on. So then it gets into, you know, your every action makes a difference. And this is, uh, again, uh, this slideshow is meant to be an entry point for this kind of stuff. I do think that there is room to um, build on action-based thinking. A little bit more of uh, how to set goals. A lovely quote there by, um, by our favorite climate activists. And then there's a review slide. So that is the presentation. I'm gonna come back to my, uh, my, my slideshow for tonight over here. And in the last few minutes, I just wanted to share um, a couple other resources. So that was our resource and uh, that's the overview. Um, but like I was just saying again, that's an entry point. So I, I highly encourage if you're using this presentation, use it as the starting point. And then you can use access some other re resources to continue on. Uh, the Climate Atlas of Canada, amazing resource. Um, if you click that there, there's all sorts of, um, you can manipulate the, the the data on the map. So it's going to show you a map of Canada and your students can go in and change, change dials to see what's going to happen um, with the future of our whole country. So that's a wonderful resource. This one is brand new from LSF. So Learning for a Sustainable Future, Empowering uh, Learners in a Warming World. I actually went to their launch webinar just last night and this is a really cool resource. How I kind of see this one playing in, I could see our presentation being used as that first step. And then this one goes really much deeper into the inquiry process behind climate change. So there's some fantastic resources built in that one. I see Cassandra is sharing um, the links in the chat for all of these as well, which is awesome. Another manipulative um, or um, a tool that your students can manipulate is um, this on roads climate change simulator. This one's cool to, for them to learn a little bit more about policies. 
So in this simulator, they can say like, what will happen to our climate projections if we take a ton of action on the transportation sector, okay? And they can see how that's gonna affect our global projections or they can slide that dial the other way. What happens if we don't take any action on the transportation se sector, um, what's gonna happen to our future? So that's another really cool um, one to build on that inquiry. And last but not least, I'm a member of this Facebook group. So you, if uh, you want to access this one, you will have to join uh, Facebook if you don't already have a Facebook account. But I wanted to put it in here because I've been using this Facebook group uh, for the past year. And I love that it's a kind of a very current and up-to-date um, spot to access resources. So people are putting daily new cool resources for climate change education in this group. It's also a great spot if you have a question, if you're teaching climate change and you need support or have a question, if you put something in there, there's going to be a lot of wonderful educators who are, are there to back you up and help you out. Now to kick it off, 7.43, so uh, I've got a few minutes here before we get to question and answer. I just wanted to share with you um, five things that I think are really important when it comes for teaching climate change outside of our presentation, right? So our presentation, again, is that launching point, but there's uh, there's some things I've learned as I've, uh, as I've kind of jumped off the deep end into climate change education that I wanted to share with you. Um, and a lot of these are substantiated in research as well. So I've hyperlinked a, uh, a study there where they actually studied what is the most effective way to teach climate change. Now the first one is there is no need to reinvent the wheel. There are so many amazing climate change education resources out there, like some of the ones I've shared. Um, and I highly suggest if you're looking for something, get on Google. There are so many people who are very passionate about climate change education and there's a lot of really amazing stuff out there already that's ready to be used by teachers. Um, I also think it's really important to make it personally relevant for students and local. So again, follow their interests, but also talk about climate change from where you live, from where, from where you exist, right? Because as much as it's a global problem, um, we have to approach it from a community thinking perspective. So bring it home, explain to them that the climate change is affecting us right here in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our cities. Um, take the learning outdoors. I, uh, I'll, always, I'll always bring this one up because I am a strong believer in the power of outdoor education. Um, if, you, if kids don't have the chance to love the environment and to love nature and, and feel the benefits daily, it's hard for them to, to care. Why, why do I wanna protect nature if I, I'm not, I don't have any positive memories spent in nature. So take the learning outdoors. This is really easy to do with climate change education because uh, you, can, you can literally explore the climate. You can go outside and be like, okay, what's the weather today? Is this what we'd expect based on our climate? Those types of things are great connections for students to make. Um, provide time, space, and support for processing challenging ideas. This stuff is hard, right? Like this is scary and absolutely eco-anxiety inducing, right? Talking about their future that's gonna be majorly changed due to climate change. Um, and I was, I've, I'm of two minds with this one because I've been told that at teaching action-based climate, um, so teaching how can we solve the problem rather than just teaching the problem is a really positive way to combat kids getting eco-anxiety. But I think that you also need to provide students with a chance to sit with their anxiety and kind of process it and feel it and feel scared and feel sad and, uh, and really exp explore those feelings and then move forward from them. So I think our role as a teacher, of course, is to support the social emo emotional learning um, of all our students. And you can do that just by providing them the time and space they need to process some of these challenging ideas. And last but not least, um, uh, so another way to kind of make things more positive for students, expand beyond individual focused solutions. So, so often when we teach climate change and sustainability, we end off with, okay, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth and never use single use plastics and, you know, maybe even don't eat red meat or those things that are, are really individual. Um, and then it can leave students feeling like the, the weight of the world is on their shoulders. And I think well, individual actions are so important. Don't, don't, um, don't think that I don't believe that. But I do think we can start to teach our students, you know, individual actions are important, but what are the system changes that we need to make? What do we need to make? Uh, what do we need to change as a whole community to combat climate change? It's not just one person's, you know, fault. We need to work on this as a whole community. And I think that sense of um, those types of teaching, those types of solution helps to, um, 
make the kids feel more part of climate change action rather than kind of like, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to do anything wrong. So those are my kind of five take home I wanted to throw at the end of my webinar here, just uh, hopefully to add some, some value to um, our presentation. And that is all I've got for you. So thank you so much for joining me. I was so glad to see uh, some familiar names and some new ones in the chat tonight. Um, I'll be here for the next about, well, the next 15 minutes or so. If anybody has any questions or comments or wants to share, please feel free to share them in the chat and, um, and I'll do my best to, to answer them as well as I can. So I see, I see Bonnie says, Scud V. So Simcoe County District School Board is having a virtual film festival, Feb 22nd to 28th for students. Oh, for the movie 2040. It's really good. I've, I've watched uh, 2040. That's it's awesome. amazing. And it's so all good. dealing with eco-anxiety, but it's, it's the opposite of the inconvenient truth where it's eight minutes of doom and gloom and then 140 minutes of all the solutions that currently exist, but if they existed in more spots would take care of everything. For sure. Energy, transportation, food security, the full range. I've never been more excited and I got the rights for the school board. So it's a Monday to Friday for students and teachers. And then I got the rights for over the weekend so people can watch it as family. Awesome. That's so good. Yeah, it's, it's so a it's, really good it's one. Free, it's free for the Simcoe County uh, family, so to speak. So that's that's coming up. Cool. Thanks for sharing, Bonnie. That's I'll have to hop on board that one. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> um, and actually, well, well, some people are still in my group here. On my last slide, I do have a link to our Facebook group, Outdoor Learning with LSRCA. Uh, we mentioned it earlier as a little plug, but that's another great one you can join because if you join that one, you're going to have direct access to me and Cassandra and our whole team of outdoor and environmental educators. And we really want to support you. We want to support you taking climate change learning and bringing that to your classrooms um, and also all outdoor and environmental learning. So please feel free to join that group. And then I've also plugged our other social media channels as well. So I'll kick around for a few more minutes here, but I am conscious of everyone's time. And uh, so I will say if you uh, if you haven't got a question or a comment for me, um, you can you can sign off now and have a great evening. I'm always here to support. If you have any questions, you can email us at education at lsrca.on.ca. And um, I'm, I'm happy to help you however I can. So thank you, truly, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, sorry, I got a bail. I got another um, call, but there's also uh, through Project WET, there's a climate water and resilience manual. And I'll be trying to put together a workshop for that virtually and that'll be coming up next month. I just needed to get over the conference from last weekend and then <laughs> and then eventually I'll get on that one, but it's coming. Awesome, thanks, Bonnie. Oh, and thank you everyone so much for the nice comments in the chat. That makes me so happy. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're done. So I'm going to stop my recording here anyways.